and help me welcome Zeke. So Zeke has been a long-time contributor to the, the uh, Crowd Supply community. Uh, Zeke, what's your handle? What's your handle? Uh, KJ7NLL. That's Kilo Juliet 7 November Lima Lima. Right, so ham radio. Um, and uh, he's, he's has his own YouTube channel, has been doing great uh, videos featuring his projects, many of which incorporate Corvo uh, components. So thank you to Corvo for being a sponsor. Yep. Um, and we, and, and actually there's a, even a crossover with uh, one of the Corvo RF accelerator projects, the, uh, the Orsat ground base station. Um, so thanks, Andrew, for, for uh, shepherding that project along and, and making it happen. Um, yes, yeah, so this, this is like a, a, you know, perfect storm of, of things coming together, I feel like. Uh, so Zeke, you're gonna talk about your helical antenna and, and uh, tracker? Right, well, I'm gonna just let you go, go to it. You wanna come up here or are you back there? All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Zeke, and I made an affordable, portable, orbital desktop satellite tracker. And um, so, in December of 2023, I heard about the Oregon State Science Fair. And because I heard about it in December, that meant that I only had three months to complete my project, a 3D printed desktop satellite tracker. Now, why a satellite tracker? Well, that's because of my previous project, where I made a huge satellite tracker to contact the International Space Station using ham radio. Okay, so why 3D printed? Well, all of my other desktop-sized satellite trackers were made out of Legos, so I wanted to try something new. But the problem was, I did not have any, I did not have a 3D printer, and I did not know how to use one. So I bought myself a 3D printer, and uh, using it had a steep learning curve, but I was able to make this a fully functional desktop satellite tracker that can track satellites, planets, and stars. So today, I'm going to talk about some of the features and how it works and go into detail about all the parts, and then I'm also going to share a few tips that I learned along the way. So, let's jump right in. So the first thing I designed was the uh, 3D design model. So I designed this in Tinkercad. And as you can see, here are all the parts for it. And these parts in this area have to do with the planetary gear system. And so the planetary gear system is what moves theta, which moves the antenna, this top part, left and right. And from now on, I'll be using theta to mean moving the antenna left and right. And so the way the planetary gear system works is the motor drives the lower stage, which drives the upper stage, which drives theta. And then on the top here, connected through a flex board, we have phi, which is just a worm gear system powered by that motor that moves the antenna up and down. So as you can see, I made a whole lot of 3D print attempts and so part of the reason of this is because the teeth on the prints were so small and it was kind of hard to get that accuracy that I was needed to be able to print that. So if I were to do this again, I would use bigger teeth so I don't have to worry about accuracy. So now on the programming side of things. And so I designed I put together on a little breadboard a magnetometer, which is basically a compass for measuring theta's position. I have an accelerometer for measuring phi's position. I have an LCD screen for selecting satellites and displaying telemetry. And I have my ESP32 microcontroller, which controls it all. So this is like the step before I put it on, onto a circuit board. And so this is the real circuit board, and I just wanted to talk about some of the differences on this board. And one of the main differences is these three prongs. And those prongs, each on the bottom, have four contacts. 
And those contacts press onto the circle board on the next slide, which gives power to our flex board. And so the serial connection is just to be able to talk to it and do extra things like download satellites for now. And then we have our GPS module for getting extremely accurate positioning for tracking those satellites, planets, and stars. And then we have the LCD screen, which allows you to be able to uh, track things. And then the buttons control everything. So here's the circle board, and notice how the contacts each press onto one of those four rings. And so the reason for the circle board is it's basically a slip ring. And if we did not have a slip ring and I just used a wire, the wire would twist all up. So the circle board allows it to spin forever. And the flex board connects into a FPC connector and it just shoves right in there. And that is how we get power to the flex board on this slide. And so notice how we have teardrops here. Now teardrops are, they're there to mainly prevent what I like to call micro cracks. Now micro cracks are when you bend the circuit board one way and it doesn't connect and you bend it the other way and it does. So teardrops, and this is, that red part is where it is likely to break. So teardrops allow you to angle into that and gradually slope into the big pad so that you don't want to break at that hard change. And so now that we have that, that's where the teardrop is on the actual thing. And it's really easy to add teardrops in KiCad. Just uh, select add teardrops and it adds them everywhere. So you don't have to worry about that. And then the fatal motor mount is where we directly solder the motor for theta onto the flexible PCB. And so that will allow it to be able to move. And it will bend all up into that area on the tracker. And then the motor driver controls the theta motor, which is controlled by PWM. And then the magnetometer measures position, and there's the phi motor, it's basically the same thing as theta, and then we have our accelerometer for measuring the phi position. And it bends and connects right into the arrow, which is where the antenna goes. And so these are pictures of the actual flex board, and notice how the motors are directly soldered to it. And this allows me to bend it all up. And I just wanted to talk about some of the problems I had and some of the solutions I problem had four of those problems. So some of the problems I had were the pads would come off or the motors would solder. I would burn pads or font holes, and I'll get to that in a minute. And so uh, to fix the pads coming off when I would solder the motors, because it would all get bended up, and this is actually version two of the flex board, I can widen the copper pour and shrink the cover lay over that so it really holds it in there and it doesn't want to come out. And then I can also, uh, for burnt pads, reduce my temperature. So you just have to minimize your temperature and your heat to keep from burning those pads. So don't go above 250 degrees C when you are soldering the surface melt components. And don't go above 300 degrees C for more than five seconds when you're soldering the flue hole components. And so stenciled font. And so these are the font holes. And notice how on my V1 circuit board, notice how it's a different color, we have all these fonts. But notice how there's no holes for the B or the E. And that's not on purpose. It's supposed to look like that with all the holes. Um, and this is because of the way that they put on the cover lay for flex board. It's a separate piece, unlike traditional circuit boards. And so anything that's not connected to the main piece of cover lay will just fall off. So, what I did is I just used stenciled fonts, which connect the holes in the letters to the main piece of coverlay, and it works great. And then the holes don't fall off. So, now I just wanted to talk about how easy it is to solder these teeny tiny components. 
This is the magnetometer and accelerometer. And these ended up actually being the easiest components to solder on the entire flex board. And the reason for that is, um, and they have 0.25 millimeters between their each and their pad. And so the reason that they're so easy to solder is because they come with solder balls on each of their pads. And that allows it to nicely snap into place. So all you have to do is put the smallest dab of flux paste onto the pad, stick the component on there, heat it up, and it will magically zip into place because of the surface tension of the solder. And so if you use any solder paste on these components, that is a huge problem because they're 0.25 millimeters apart, and so they are very likely to short. Just heat them up. So now I wanted to talk about my helical antenna, and this antenna is what allows me to, well, I was going to try to receive signals from this satellite, or Sat Zero, but the problem was their low noise amplifier was broken, so uh, they were not able to send the signal to turn on their camera. However, I will be trying again to receive the signal and get their pictures of space from ORSAT 0.5 later this year. And because I want to make sure that I can receive that signal later, I want to make sure that it works. So I get my, I entered my antenna characteristics into an online calculator and I got these results. And the main two things we care about are the things highlighted in green. The half power beam width and uh, half power beam width is just the point at which minus 3 dB. Um, so if we have 15.9 dB straight forward, uh, at the half power beam which we will have 12.9 dB. And so the half power beam width is huge at 42.5 degrees. And what a dB is, is it's like a measurement of gain in a specific direction. And so that's huge. That is an amazing wide gain. So we should be good for the antenna. And 12 dB is quite a bit. We should be fine. And because I am good there, I wanted to make sure my magnetometer is accurate to 42.5 degrees. So I used a compass to measure the accuracy of the magnetometer. And my highest error was seven degrees off pointed east. And that is way less than 42.5, so we should be good there. And so now that we know that my magnetometer is accurate enough, I wanted to make sure my accelerometer is accurate enough. So first what I did is I offset it until the level was leveled and the bubble was right in between those lines. And then I took it and I rotated it up to 14, uh, I rotated it up to where it thought was 90 degrees, and I measured 14.2 degrees of error when I took a picture of it and moved that arrow. And 14.2 is still way less than 42.5, my half power beam width, but I wanted to make it even less. So there is actually a way to do that. I can divide the error by two, and you know how I was offsetting phi over here? Well. I can offset it plus 14.2 divided by 2, which is 7.1. And I can offset it plus that so that we get that 7.1 degree error. And it would be 0 degree error with the level leveled, but now we have 7.1. And then if we move the antenna up to where it thinks is 45 degrees, it will actually be 45 degrees, no error. And then if we move it up to where it thinks 90 degrees is, we'll have a negative 7.1 degree error again. And 7.1 degrees is even less than 14.2, so we're even better there, way less than 42.5. And so now I'd like to thank all of these organizations for helping me and supporting me on my project. And <sighs> go subscribe to my YouTube channel and check out my GitHub for more links. Uh, for my, all the code that I used for my desktop satellite tracker 
and I will be doing a demo outside, so go check that out. If you have any questions, that would be a great time to ask them. Uh, thank you. I was very uh, intrigued by your choice of using a planetary gear system to drive data. Could you talk more about that, uh, why you decided on that, and what alternatives you might have considered? So the reason I did a plan to, let me back up to that slide, yeah, the wrong laptop. So the reason I did a planetary gear system is one, because I've never done it before, two, because it looks really cool, um, because there is double stage, so the bottom stage is moving really fast and the top stage is moving slower, and three, because I wanted to try something new. Um, so I recently learned about a cycloidal gear system, and I think that could be another cool option for it. Um, but this is what we have right now, and it seems to be working. However, it does get stuck a lot. <laughs> Would it e even be possible to use direct drive instead of going through a gear system? That was the question. Probably yes, but uh, going through a gear system allows it to look better. <laughs> <laughs> and make it stronger. Uh, uh, thank you. I was a little surprised at um, how large of an error you got in the fee in the elevation. Um, I wonder, is, is, did you use a, only a single axis accelerometer? Did you intentionally use a lower grade accelerometer because you knew that you had a large margin for error? Uh, would you discuss a little bit about that, please? So in the data sheet, uh, this is like one of the components that's like used in phones. And so in the data sheet, it said that it would be accurate to like one or two degrees. Um, and so I did not calibrate the accelerometer. Um, however, the magnetometer was calibrated, and it was still supposed to be within one or two degrees, but the compass I was measuring it with was a phone compass, so it might not have been accurate. Was the accelerometer one axis or three axis? It's a three axis accelerometer. Oh, we only use one of the axes and stuff. Any other questions? Yeah. Hey, yeah, this is a really interesting project. It's it's too bad there's not like a company or something that could would sell it for you. <laughs> I'll have to think about that one. Hey, Josh. Yeah. 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 I'll sell it. So uh, could this be a uh, crowd supply kit, so when we have RSAT 1 up and where people are making the handheld ground stations, they can also have one of your uh, automatic ground stations? Yeah, so I'm planning to sell this as a kit, mm -hmm. and um, one of the main reasons is because I wanted to be able to receive signals from RSAT, and so an antenna goes on top of here and it can track it, and so this could be an RSAT kit that build and receive pictures from. And the ORSAT 0.5 satellite that you just mentioned, I, I believe Andrew just handed that off, I heard today, two weeks ago, uh, to for launch. So when's, when's launch? July 10th. July 10th. Okay, so coming up. Uh, so yeah, that project is, is really ramping up, and it's awesome to see people like Zeke uh, uh, interacting with it and, and, and building on it. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well thanks again to Zeke and to the Corvo team for their support. Uh, this is great.